I didn't turn this into white magic yet, so hold on with that. But uh, at least putting this on white background on my slides should brighten the topic. And knowing that I'm going to talk in uh, walls of the University of Business, I put economy, econo economy next to this. So I'll try to do this a little bit less technical, but for every one of you to understand, and a little bit more maybe economical, just to understand the impact that it has on our everyday lives. Okay, so what is API? How many of you are developers, coders, programmers? Okay, so we've got five of us here, and for five of us, this is the definition. So basically, API is nothing else but just a set of definitions, protocols, standards, by which two different programs can communicate with each other. For everyone else, this is what API is, right? <laughs> you've got two programs, they communicate with each other. They are communicating by the meaning of API. Usually, these two programs are not running on the same computer. They might be running on two different computers. They can be running on two different devices. They can be running on different parts of the world. And usually, one of them is someone who is providing particular service, and the other one is who consuming the service, extending the service, making something new out of this service. The API world is something that you are living in, no matter if you are aware of this or not. If you are logging into your favorite service, just using Facebook logon, you are already using Facebook API, right? We've heard today earlier that you don't want to remember all your passwords, so you are saying, I remember only my Facebook logon, and this is the only one that I use to log everywhere. Is it good or bad? Maybe we will mention this at the very end. You talk to chatbot, or basically you think that you are talking to some bank agent or someone else to insurance agent. But at the back end, there is a chatbot which is using API from some platform just to talk to you and to tell you a joke, just to show that there is a human behind this. You are driving using Yanoshik. You are displayed on the map. It is OpenStreetMap API that is being used to show your location. You display to others your heartbeat, as we've seen today earlier. It is a device talking to application, displaying this data, talking through the API. And even if you are just opening a very simple web page, I believe there is 90% chance that behind this, there is either Google Analytics API, uh, Adobe Omniture API, or P Pivik Pro API, which is a company from Wroclaw, who is tracking your movements on the web. This whole API world changed the way we behaved. This is a tweet that went viral last year in 2017. 20 years ago, we were taught, do not meet strangers on the internet, do not get into someone else's car. Today, this is what you do. You go to the internet to find a stranger and to get into his car. <laughs> and this is how you are driving the API economy. The API economy that is estimated to be about 2.2 trillion US dollars this year. API economy by itself is nothing, uh, is, is relatively new term. Uh, as my son would say, wujek uh, Google i ciotka Wikipedia mają dla ciebie wszystkie odpowiedzi. For those of you who don't understand Polish here, Uncle Google and Aunt Wikipedia answer all your questions. So if we ask Uncle Google how the recent the API economy trend is. It is only about maybe five years that people are searching on this, and this is something that is growing. But everything new is well forgotten old. And to give you some background, let me start a little bit earlier. Year 1981, Time magazine called Lech Valenza to be a person of the year. It was the beginning of sunset of the previous epoch that some of us still remember living in this part of Europe. 1982, for the very first time, the same magazine picks personal computer to be a person of the year, or machine of the year, obviously, as they called at that time. Why it is important to put in the context of what I'm talking about is if you are looking at the short history of APIs, it was pretty much the operating systems of these personal computers that starting the whole technology revolution with APIs, with the very simple business background. So this operating system, you can think about this as a platform that allows developers 
to build new applications on top of this by using this application programming interface. These developers build these applications, and then there are users, consumers, who are using these applications. And this is where it just starts going as a snowball, right? The more popular platform is, the more developers are using this, the more developers are developing the application, the more consumers and end users are using this, the more, uh, the more end users there are, the more popular platform is, the more developers want to develop, and this is how it is, how it is rolling. Uh, 1990s application systems that are running businesses need these extension points as well, and this is where a lot of effort started to evolve around how to unify and harmonize the way all these business applications are talking. Right? This is where uh, the consortium of different companies uh, that uh, were part of World Wide Web Consortium started working on the unified language for the internet era called XML, extendable markup language. If you ever heard, if you ever will hear this word once again, once you're uh, out of here, please just remember me. Maybe I was the very first one to mention this XML to you. But what is really interesting is that it is not only big corporates and big corporations, uh, sorry, big consortia that can drive standards. Uh, there is a single man who wrote his PhD thesis in 2000 that has really interesting chapter five, the REST interface, and this is today the dominant way in which all the applications are communicating with each other on the web. The same year, 2000, uh, some companies like eBay started realizing the value of opening their own systems to the outside world, to the outside developers, turning their private systems into what we call platform. And remember the snowball uh, analogy that I told you, you're opening the platform, you get more developers uh, providing some additional functionality, you get more users, you get more users, the platform is becoming more popular. And this is what these people realized. 2002, the very same thing is happening with Amazon Web Services. 2006, Amazon goes even one step further. I don't know how many of you are aware, but basically for Amazon today, the main business is not selling stuff on the internet, but providing infrastructure services to others, something that is called cloud. While all this happening, we all became a part of something that was called partic participatory web. So how many of you have posted anything on web, be this video, post, comment, status update, and so on and so forth? OK. Pretty much everyone. And everyone who understands English, at least. <laughs> and. Uh, this is something that, as well, Carolina mentioned today, right? Internet gave you the power. The participatory web 2006 is when there was more content developed by participants of the web than there was content produced by all these companies just putting the web pages. And this is once again why Time magazine in 2006 called you as a person of year. You, everyone who participates in this web, who got this power of internet that Carolina mentioned earlier today. This is something that was called Web 2.0. Mainstream magazines were talking about this. But some other things went a little bit unnoticed. The same year, 2006, there is a conference in Edinburgh, something that only very specialized technology uh, journalists noticed, something that they called a new revolutionary web, Web 3.0, the one that is uh, enabling semantic web. And what is semantic web? Semantic web is when machine, the program, can understand what is there on the web. Year 2014, I don't know how many of you noticed this. There were a couple of discussions already uh, today on this topic. But this is when, if you are afraid of Terminator, if you are afraid of Skynet, Skynet this is when it happened already. 2014, there are more devices on the planet Earth than humans. Worth this to mention that there are more mobile devices than there are toothbrushes on the Earth. So all these machines connected to the internet, they need to communicate. But all these machines as well enable companies to provide their services in different ways. One of these is Netflix. 
Uh, something that I had the pleasure to observe kind of like uh, firsthand. I used to live in the United States at that moment. I was one of these Netflix subscribers receiving DVDs uh, over the mailing service uh, at that time. And then around this 2011, they started offering streaming service. Something that quite many people have already today, even in Poland, if they want to watch, for example, House of Cards, right? But the thing about this is they are supporting right now about 1,000 different hardware devices on which you can stream these movies, right? Starting from your mobile phone, through your desktop, through game console, through your smart TV, and so on and so forth. And all these devices, they are communicating with a single backend through the meaning of the API. But hardware is, not, is only one part of the equation. The second one is software. And software is eating the world something that uh, was coined in 2011. This is where some people are saying atoms are being turned into bits. And this is where as well something that is called digital transformation came into play and into the vocabulary of all the salespeople uh, trying to sell some new ideas. But the digital transformation is real and there are several disruptive technologies behind this. Some of them were mentioned already here so basically, machine learning, something that is uh, digitalizing our brain. Internet of Things, something that is digitalizing our environment or even help us to quantify ourselves, as we've, saw, uh, as we've seen today with the, heart uh, with the heartbeat. Chatbot, something that I mentioned already. Uh, or last but not least, blockchain, so digitalizing of trust, which should help to eliminate, if not all lawyers, then at least some of them the nightmare of Tomek. <laughs> uh, the other term that I would like you to kind of like print somewhere in your brain is so-called bimodal IT, especially if you are students right now and you are about to uh, start your professional career as well. Every enterprise have to operate in two modes right, right now. One, they need to keep their basic operations running, and this is the stable core that each of these companies needs to have. And on the other hand, all these disruptive technologies, you use them or you're just falling out of the game. So you need to be able to innovate at the edge of your enterprise while keeping your business running. And the way to keep, uh, to keep these two IT modes in sync is through these APIs. So I tried to put a little bit of the technology background and technology history for you to understand. But again, as we are at the School of Business, probably all of us are waiting for this one. Show me the money. The money here is in unleashing some open innovation. So the guys who created Instagram, I don't think they would ever imagine that people can use this as a platform to sell ships in Kuwait. This is why this open innovation is so important. This is something that, as well, Carolina mentioned today, crowdfunding the ideas, right? Getting people like your customers or your developers to participate and to invent stuff based on what you can provide and expose through your API. So this open API, as I mentioned, it is about open innovation. Uh, there is uh, the website that is called Programmable Web. The most popular uh, open API registry or directory uh, out there on the web. And for a long time, it was used to track actually how this API economy is developing, how many new e APIs, these interfaces that can be programmed are being added there. Some of these inter uh, interfaces can surprise you, like, for example, Marvel. I assume that some of you have heard of Marvel. If not, that you have heard of superheroes, Spider-Mans, Iron Mans, and so on and so forth. These guys, they are providing open API for everyone who would like to query what are all the Supermans whose name starts with Super? What were comics and what are the covers of these comics in which they appeared? In what years Iron Man appeared in what movies and so on and so forth? Why? Once again, this is the snowball, right? You provide the platform, you want developers to get interested in this. You want them to build applications. You want to attract new users who will attract more attention to your platform and more developers and so on and so forth. But APIs are making news, right? So I'm going to mention this only briefly, but 
all of you who were lazy to remember your passwords and were using Facebook API and sharing all your information about all the websites that you are um, that you are visiting with Facebook probably have heard about the recent uh, uh, the recent uh, storm around the inappropriate use of these Facebook APIs, right? And this is, for example, I'm subscribed to this mailing, 10 most important things you need to know today, and recently about 50% of this are about the abuse of these APIs. But not all APIs are open. Some of them are very specific, for example, available only for partners, and then company that provide these APIs, who attract these partners to build this additional software, to build these additional uh, applications, obviously need to help these developers to monetize this and providing something that is called marketplace. I believe that pretty much every one of you who has a smartphone is aware of that as well. You go to Google Play, Google Play or App Store, you just download applications that have been built by some other developers for your platform. Customer use APIs is where some companies just monetizing on these APIs but by selling their data or selling their algorithms, like for example, this Green Planet, which helps you to calculate your footprint, carbon footprint uh, from your activities. And then internal APIs, something that you might never see but that are being used internally by companies, companies like Adidas. You would never associate Adidas with something like this, but as, as they explained on one of the blogs, every company today is a software company. Marvel is a software company. Adidas is a software company. But still, the most prominent, the most famous example, at least in our developers' world, uh, for the turning APIs into great business advantage, still remains the company that turned their online book shopping into multi-billion cloud company by putting for the very first among all this company this approach API first. I'm talking about the Amazon and this information leaked to the public about five years ago when one of the guys who used to be developer at Amazon by accident published a post not privately but publicly. Since then, it became famous, but this is the note that Jeff Bezos sent to his employees in 2002. Every part of the company has to provide all their services and data through APIs or interfaces. Everyone has used these interfaces. There is no other way to get into this data. Uh, you need to be ready to provide these APIs publicly as well. Everyone who will not adhere to these rules will be fired. Thank you, have a good day. I'm not going to fire you for not following these rules, but all I want to say, thank you, have a good day. <laughs>